Does everybody know what this slide is from? <coughs> hands, show of hands. Not very many people. That's depressing, you know. Uh, this is one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time from when I was a kid, and nobody seems to get the joke. But uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to have a more relevant, maybe a Disney movie sometime next time I do this. Um, uh, as Seon mentioned, uh, most people don't, Nex don't know Nexon, and I actually don't have any slides just on Nexon. I'm not going to present to you about why you should buy Nexon stock. Instead, Patrick and I are going to talk about the future of the video games industry. And we're going to do that because we think if you thought about the world the way that we did, you would understand why Nexon is the, on the path and why you should own Nexon stock. So that'll be my sales job for Nexon for the entire presentation. You'll be, barely hear about us. Other than to say, just so you know for sizing, Nexon was founded in Korea. We created the first online uh, MMORPG called King Kingdom of the Winds. Today, Dungeon and Fighter is, in terms of life-to-date revenue, which is our biggest game, uh, uh, Dungeon Fighter is perhaps the largest game in terms of life-to-date revenue of all time. It's up there with Call of Duty and a few others. We don't know if it's one, two, or three, um, because nobody uh, really publishes their, their, their numbers, but based off of what we see in Morgan Stanley's reports. Uh, it's up there with Grand Theft Auto and, and Call of Duty. But most people don't know that because our biggest market is China. China generates about 40 to 50% of our revenues. We employ about 6,500 people around the world. And uh, we're listed in Tokyo, founded in Korea. I'm from California. And so we're hard to understand. Um, and our biggest market is China. OK, so with that as back, oh, we do uh, about $2.5 billion in top line a year in revenue. And we generate somewhere between $850 and $1 billion in cash flow a year. So that gives you a sense of our size and profit and so on. Um, OK. As I said, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. I'm not going to beat you over the head talking about Nexon, but uh, we are going to talk to you about the future of the video games business. And before diving in, I want to give you a little context. I became CEO of Nexon about five years ago, and before that, I was the CFO. And um, during the course of taking the company public in 2011, uh, what we realized during the roadshow was that our view of how video games work was fundamentally different than almost every institutional investor we met during the three weeks of roadshow. I mean, it was really quite an education for me. Um, and uh, one of the questions we got, as an example, was what are we going to do about the imminent shift in the games market? This is 2011. In the imminent, imminent shift of the games market out of PC games and into Facebook and mobile games. The very question was based off of a mental model that we just simply didn't share. We didn't think that the world was going to go to Facebook games. Um, so as a response to these types of questions that we've had since 2011, since going public, uh, we started about three years ago to create present, you know, a way of communicating with our shareholders that sort of poked fun at the industry and how what we thought the dumb money was always falling for the flashy trends of the industry. And the first, of these point, the first of these presentations pointed out that the most important ideas and mental models in video games were the ones that were the least valued. For example, we said we thought VR was going to be an utter train wreck. Tens of billions of dollars were going to go up in smoke. Uh, that actually ended up happening. Um, and, uh, but at the time that we said it, it was pretty controversial. The situation seems so absurd to us that we drew this analogy to Moneyball. And I think everybody here has at least seen the movie Moneyball. Yes? and read the book, uh, I think most investors have. It's really about a value investor who realized that things like RBIs is not what wins base baseball games. I'm American, so I, I think about baseball. Uh, but RBIs don't win baseball games. Getting on base wins baseball games. So if you draw walks, and you make 80K a year, and you're overweight, you can still be the most valuable member of the team. And that analogy was really uh, seemed pretty relevant to us because um, uh, that same sort of thinking or la disparity in mental models seems to happen in the video games industry. And that sparked a really valuable dialogue with uh, many of our most thoughtful investors. So a year later, we doubled down on this approach. And we made a second presentation where we took dead aim at several additional cliches of the video games industry and said that if you believe these cliches, you, the money manager, are going to lose money in this industry. And uh, the underlying theme of those two were that nearly everything you have learned about video games business in the past is going to cause you to lose money in the future. And you can go back to see those presentations. Uh, a few of them are on um, YouTube. And uh, decide for yourself if they would have helped you avoid uh, losing money if you saw them then. But I'll, I'll make it fast for you. 
Um, review some of the topics that we took dead aim at. We said uh, App Store, you know, that there's the cliche that App Store rankings indicate success. We used to get this all, question all the time. Hey, Owen, your such and such mobile app has gone down two slots. Should I sell your stock? I'm oversimplifying, uh, oversimplifies, Im, oversimplifying a little bit. But um, the point that we were making is you can artificially juice up your rankings on the app stores very, very easily it's just by... I'm sorry, that's my Mac talking, uh, reminding me of the time. Thank you. Uh, high tech in, in the works here. Um, but you could push up your rankings by just spending marketing money. And in fact, a lot of the companies did exactly that, and you would drive your margins past below zero, and you would drive yourself into bankruptcy, which is exactly what happened to several of those companies from two or three years ago. Second, two or three years ago, everyone asked us about our VR strategy, and I've already taken, I've already made fun of VR. I'm gonna do it again several times in this presentation. Today, VR has an active installed base of roughly zero million people. Um, so that was a dumpster fire, uh, but everybody was talking about it. I couldn't get through an investor meeting without the first three questions being about what Nexon's VR strategy was. And I, being an honest CEO, said, we have none, it sucks. And people told me I couldn't say that, but um, it ended up being that way. A lot of money, a lot of money went down the, train, uh, down the drain. Fortunately, other than Facebook, most of that money was in the venture capital space, which uh, uh, is less relevant for, for the people in this room. Um, Next is eSports, and with all respect to the other panelists who uh, may have been in the room or may come later, uh, it's not quite the train wreck that, um, that VR has been, at least yet, but it's, I don't think it's on a tra track to replace the NFL anytime soon. And uh, I can't name a company that's making a reasonable profit from that space. There's been several articles written recently. Uh, Kotaku had a great article. Kotaku is a blog that covers the games industry. It had a terrific article about a month ago on this. We've done our analysis, we can't figure it out. And by the way, we practically invented uh, eSports. By the way, we're, we were founded in Korea. Korea has had eSports for over 15 years. We know a thing or two what we talk about in the eSports business. The Americans are always like Christopher Columbus, right? They, they discover the new world and they're like, hey, it's, this place has never existed before and it turns out there's been people living on the land for a long time. Um, that's the eSports business. Um, and last but not least is the monumentally stupid idea that there are two tiers of game companies, those that can afford AAA games and those that cannot. And the implication was that AAA is what's required for success. You can't develop, if you can't put $100 million into, a tri uh, into building a game, you will not be successful in our industry. You'll get outgunned by the big guys. And then PUBG and Fortnite were the latest ones after, say, Minecraft, which was made by one guy. Uh, to, there, there are many, many examples over the last 10 years where someone has just taken a, a flamethrower to that whole idea. So if you had invested your money in, in those widely held mental models as a guidepost, you would have lost money. And the point is not that we're saying, I told you so, it's that if there's one thing to know about video games, it's that you have to really examine closely your premises and not follow the cliches. Most of these cliches are made up by people who either don't play games or who are trying to sell you something. And then they get their voices in the press and then you listen to them and you think that that's a thing that you have to really pay attention to. And it's not necessarily or usually true. So you need to exercise a lot of skepticism. But having said all that, uh, we strongly believe that you should invest in the video game sector because of all the media industries, it's the biggest, it's growing the fastest, and it has the highest profit. You can see here on the left, I've, we've got linear entertainment. And on the right, we've got interactive entertainment. And as you can see, we're a lot bigger and we're growing at triple the rate. And uh, we're also, companies like Nexon are a whole lot more profitable, which is to say we are profitable in our industry um, than linear entertainment. So uh, that's one thing to really keep in mind. The other is, uh, if you're a value investor, um, because of all the BS that I've just been talking about that floats around in our industry, it makes for a very target-rich environment if you're willing to do a little bit of research and think about first principles. And that's what we want to talk to you about today. And we think that this growth is going to accelerate, not because of some pedestrian cliche like esports or VR, but because of deep interactive entertainment is rapidly going from the fringes to being universal, to being central to people's lives, lots and lots of people's lives. And we're in the middle of an explosion of new technology that is bigger than anything since the dawn of the internet 25 years ago. These technologies are gonna be used in crazy and unpredictable ways by game makers like Patrick, who I'll introduce in a second, 
uh, people with imagination. And this tech combined with imagination is where the real hits are going to come from, where the real money is going to be made. And within the next few years, everything about online games uh, is going to change. How customers access them, how game operators and publishers operate those games, and how game developers uh, uh, build those games. And so for the remainder of this presentation, Patrick and I are going to talk about uh, these three technology developments. And for each, we're going to tell you why we think it's important and cl how close it is to reality. And then we'll tell you what we think the economic benefits are to a company like Nexon. And then I want to conclude very briefly with some ideas on how to make money as an investor and how to avoid losing money. So that's my long-winded background uh, on what we're going to do in the next few minutes. First is about how customers access games. The topic is platform convergence, I understand, and I was looking at the board uh, before. You guys have been talking about that a lot earlier today and will more. Uh, let me tell you what it means from the perspective of a game creator like us. Platform convergence has been playing out right in front of our eyes. Uh, think about only five years ago, uh, what did a game world look like? You had really two levels of machines. You had these high-end PCs with great-looking graphics and really great networking. And they enabled things like super high-end first-person shooters, massively multiplayer online role-playing playing games, and the like. And a tiny percentage of the world's population had PCs with a really good graphics card and a fast internet connection, a tiny percentage. And then you had a much more massive segment of the public playing much more limited games on mobile devices. That's the ones at the bottom here. Um, these devices were great because they were with you at all times, but they could only play limited games, mostly single player games. Single player games that didn't last for very long. They were not designed to last very long. So from a game company perspective, you didn't have any sort of hope for an annuity, uh, or it was very unusual that you would have any sort of uh, recurring revenues. So unlike PC games, you download a lot of them, you play them for a short session, then you didn't tend to stick to them over time. And now what is happening? Well, these platforms are converging. They're becoming the same device. Think about it. Now everyone in this room and around the world has a high-end workstation in their pocket. As Oprah said at a recent Apple event, billions of people with workstations in their pocket. This is a very big deal for our business. Um, Meantime, the hardware manufacturers are making it really easy to treat this pocket-sized workstation that's in your pocket as a full workstation. You can connect to other devices very easily, just using things like USB-C and Bluetooth. Uh, so think about it. You are, go to the work in the morning. You put this, this high-end workstation down, take it out of your pocket, put it on the, on the uh, desk in front of you, and it lights up the whole thing. In a few years, I'm not even going to be running this, a presentation like this off of this Mac. I'll be running it off of a, of, off of a mobile device. Um, and uh, what's interesting about this is today, today we think about this as, yeah, this is kind of where the world is going. Apple's starting to talk about, about it. Samsung is starting to build stuff in. But two years ago, this was a heretical view. But clearly Apple and the other hardware makers are going in this direction. You know, I, I play Fortnite with a group of ni ninth graders in my son's class, and two-thirds of them are playing on their mom's hand-me-down phones. It's a really interesting thing. This was not... This was not possible just a couple years ago, and it's here today. And now cloud gaming has arrived. And despite the demonstration that's going on in the other room that's being run over in Google's defense over apparently a, a mobile phone, uh, it's, uh, we're, we're going to be living in a world of cloud gaming. And um, there are no less, by our count, no less than five companies that have announced that they want to be the Netflix of games. Now, we're going to see how all this plays out, but there are two big implications for us as game companies and therefore for you as the investor. First, the ability to create and operate game content becomes strategically very important. This is as much of a sales pitch you'll get for a company like Nexon as, as you'll get for much of this presentation. If you are a content creator and you're good, you've got the key commodity that is scarce. Money in this world is not scarce. GPUs, graphics processing units, are not scarce. Um, and platforms certainly are not scarce. We can publish Nexon Games and EA and Activision and all the others can publish on multiple different platforms. Platforms are not scarce. But content and how to make a game last and grow for a long time, meaning recurring revenues, uh, meaning annuities, are very, very scarce in this world. Second, the TAM, the total addressable market, goes way up. 
Previously, if you wanted to deliver an immersive game, the kind people would play for years on end, like Nexon games, you mostly did that on a PC. Now, as I said before, nearly everyone has a workstation with them all day in their pocket every day, which can play a deep, deeply immersive game. This is an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude at least increase in the total addressable market for the kinds of immersive games that last and grow for 15 years like Nexons. This is a huge thing for us. And unlike the past, the world is about to be drowning in GPUs and networking uh, that can sustain massive online games. Okay, so that was about access and about TAM. The next is about how we operate games, and I'll go through pretty quickly on this because I want to make sure we have enough time for, for Patrick's segment. Um, let me go out on a limb here. I think that AI is going to change everything. It's massively important for the future of interactive entertainment, much more so in games than it is for how it's being used in other parts of the internet, like shopping, like suggesting a good book if you've already read a book that you like on Amazon or a good movie from Netflix or something like that. It's going to be, or music on Spotify. It's a much bigger deal on games. And I'll give you some mundane but very important examples. Uh, a few years ago, we started a project at Nexon um, that is about leveraging AI. The thing to remember about online games is they are very tricky to run. Um, they take a lot of people who are very intelligent and very well trained. A lot of the newcomers to online games, especially in the free-to-play space, have seen their initially promising starts fizzle over time. And that problem is often, if not usually, about post-launch post-launch operations or development. You see this over and over in our industry. A game will go up and then it'll go down uh, over time. And a lot of it is about post-launch uh, development and, 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 and events. And this is a, a, an interesting picture. This is from our Japan office. And these are live game operators servicing one of our games. And what are they doing there? Well, they're communicating with people in the game. Remember, these are, we're talking about virtual worlds with thousands and thousands of players in the same world. They're throwing parties. They're, they're dealing with customer issues. They're dealing with gold farmers. They're managing the money supply uh, because we have in-game gold and you've got to make sure you don't have inflation or deflation because otherwise people will quit because the game stops being fun. Um, but a lot of it is, uh, you know, we use data tools and dashboards and things like that, but a lot of it is pure grunt work and feel. Now, we've got some really smart AI and computer scientists uh, working in ways to teach the machines how to handle a lot of that grunt work. The first step was to wire up all the tools to our biggest games. And most of the, the good news for us is most of the tools are off the shelf. There's a lot of great stuff that is um, now uh, inexpensively and easily procurable. And now that we've mostly done with the wiring up and the building of the infrastructure, uh, we can build custom tools on, on top of those uh, tools that we've procured to manage the games and much more effectively. And I'll give you two quick examples. Um, let's talk about matchmaking. It may not seem obvious, but it's super important. Let me ask you a question. Um, first of all, who in this room is a gamer? Is it like would consider themselves a gamer, first person shooter? Anybody a first person shooter gamer here? Okay, good. So a, a decent number of people. Let's say you're new to an online game like Battlefield. Has anybody here played Battlefield? Yes? Okay, great. Well, you can thank Patrick. He's the father of Battlefield. Um, uh, or Fortnite. Has anybody played Fortnite or seen their kids play? OK, so you walk into Fortnite or Battlefield. And um, the question is, uh, who do you want to play that game with? You're in an online world. What kinds of people do you want to play the game with? Of course, you want to play with people who are about as good as you or a little bit better. So you get a little bit of challenge or some challenge, but not too much challenge. But here's what often happens. You step into that cool looking first person shooter, like I did with my son and his crew and a few weeks ago, and you find you're up against an army of 15-year-old Rambos. Has anybody seen this film, at least? <laughs> <laughs> yes? OK, good. Uh, and it's actually not fun. It's, it actually really stinks. And it's a big problem. It's a big problem for a game developer, because if, you, if people don't have fun in the game, they leave, and they tend to not come back. It's expensive to get them back and convince them to come back in the game. So matchmaking is a very big deal in our world. Um, and here's where the AI comes in. Nexon's AI tools can watch how you go through the game's tutorial and monitor your keyboard and mouse moves. And within about 15 seconds, it can tell whether you're new to all first-person shooters or just to this first-person shooter. And it can appropriately matchmake you to people who are roughly your skill level. And it gets a little bit better at this all the time. 
This is a huge deal. You can't do this with humans. You can only do this with machines. Um, so this is a fantastic use, a mundane but very, very good uh, and immediately applicable and um, beneficial use of AI. By the way, this technology is already here and we are already starting to implement it and it's having a terrific impact already. By the way, we can use a similar technology to recommend friends to you. This is important in the game since who you cooperate with is as important to your fun in the game as who you compete against. And there's a lot more to this. Uh, the machines can watch uh, all the play of all the players all day long so we can form a very good profile of their preferences. So for each player, our AI engine can create a very valuable profile. It can then customize rewards or product recommendations or all sorts of marketing or even other games to play. So even the most experienced and knowledgeable game oper operations expert can't do this sort of thing on an individual level. All this translates to a much better user experience and that means retention of players and that means revenue growth for game companies or a game company like Nexon. By the way, uh, we started rolling out these tools about a year ago uh, in one of our biggest games, and the impact has been immediate material. Uh, if you can see on the lower left-hand corner, this is MapleStory. MapleStory is our second biggest game. This is the lifetime revenue graph in one country, the country that it started in, in Korea, where we started it in 2003, way back, uh, 16 years ago. And uh, you can see the game has been on something of a tear lately. Uh, this is, again, if you looked at a screenshot of MapleStory, you'd say, yes, this game looks like it was made 15 years ago, and look at the revenue graph. This is one of the biggest uh, games in our industry, and it has been growing very substantially uh, over the last few years. And our live operations teams think that, you know, other than the fact that they're geniuses and making games go for a long time, they also really uh, hand a lot of credit over to the AI tools that we've started to put into the game. That's what, they've, that's what we believe. Uh, based off of uh, just the beginnings of the AI tools that are about retention and, uh, and smart monetization. So we think this is really impactful. Uh, and we're starting to roll it out to other franchises as well. So we talked about the revolution in how players access games and how that grows the total addressable market and the revolution in how we operate games, uh, which does all sorts of other good things. Uh, financially and otherwise for, for Nexon. And the third technology revolution is about how we build games. And to talk about this in more detail and much more eloquently than I can, I've asked Patrick Soderlund. Um, he's going to introduce himself, but just so everybody who is not familiar with Nexon and, and Embark knows, uh, Nexon acquired Embark Studios uh, based in Stockholm a few months ago. And uh, it's, a new t it's a new company, but not a new team. The team is, uh, is some of the most bankable veterans in the games business. Um, they were most recently at uh, Electronic Arts for a very long period of time where Patrick ran the studios uh, at, at that company. I got to know Patrick about 17 years ago when I made the initial investment in the acquisition of Dice, uh, another a previous company that Patrick ran that brought uh, him and, and Dice into uh, Nexon when I was at Electronic Arts. Um, so he's gonna talk to you about making games. Okay, to further add to the complication, I'm not Japanese, I'm not Korean, and I'm not American. <laughs> I live in Sweden, and I'm Swedish. Um, thanks, Owen, for introducing me. Um, I'm Patrick Sutherland. I'm the CEO and founder of Embark Studios in Stockholm. I have worked with games for almost 25 years. Um, in the late 1990s, um, my first studio, Refraction Games, started building a prototype for a multiplayer game. Um, a shooter that allowed for big um, teams to fight battles online. And um, we then got acquired by a company called Dice, and that prototype that we were building became Battlefield. And the Battlefield series um, obviously went on to become a multi-billion dollar franchise um, after EA acquired Dice in 2006. Uh, after that, I served uh, in many different roles at EA, and the last four to five years at EA, I um, ran the Worldwide Studio Organization for EA. Um, after leaving in 2018, I um, founded Embark Studios uh, and we're today a relatively small developer based in Stockholm, Sweden. So yes, uh, as, as I told you, I worked for a long time in, in the video game space and uh, you know, one of my favorite games of all times are is Doom, it's the first 3D game I played, loved it and still love it. Um, but let me just give you some perspective. Um, in many ways, progress have been tremendous. You know, you can just look at the picture here from 1994 and then to 2004, 
where where um, Doom 4 came out, and then you know, you know, we're excited about Doom Eternal coming out sometime next year. Yes, the games are prettier, they're shinier, they're better. But if you you know, if I allow myself to be a little bit cynical for a while, the games themselves, um, in many ways. Um, haven't changed much. You know, I'm basically playing the game the same way. I'm running around, I'm shooting bad guys, <laughs> and it's in essence the same game I played 20 years ago. Um, I know that's a little bit harsh, but to some extent that's the, that's the same. And I would go as far to say as a lot of game development, a lot of games that have come out, the progress have been more incremental than transformational. Um, and what I mean by this is the introduction of 3D graphics and everything have, have, have obviously changed a ton, but if you look at them, especially in the AAA space, um, there's a lot of sequels and they look and play the same way. Um, I think that's a problem. And then progress have been, as I said, incremental rather than transformational. I do have to say though, to be fair to many, other, Owen mentioned some of them, there are games out there and games companies who, um, have showed up and done the unexpected. And, and a lot of them have gone um, out and broke new ground and have been incredibly commercially successful. And um, I think there's a common characteristics that I find to be interesting among these products, and I want to spend some time on it. You know, games like Minecraft, Owen said it, built by virtually one guy, and came out of left field uh, and completely changed our industry. You know, there was a self-published game that broke all the conventional uh, ways of, of making a game um, and how it launched together with, you know, that I think puzzled some of the big game publishers. You know, my son's favorite game, Roblox, uh, is built by an incredible team and they built it for a decade. And, but it's also a game where the team has continued to invest in it and is now reaching, you know, you know great success, um, but also built by a small team a very different type of game idea than what you normally would see. Fortnite, I think, is something that inspires me. What Tim and the guys have done over at Epic is pretty astounding. Uh, you know, it's another self-published game put together by a smallish team um, that broke some hard-held industry convictions about both monetization and platform logic. And I think these examples illustrate a conviction that I've come to, which is games that defy conventions will probably not come from traditional games companies. And um, then, you know, if you agree with me, then the answer is why? Why do we think that's the case? So to explain some of this, and, and bear with me for a moment, this is an image that looks quite um, odd until I give you what it is. Uh, this is actually the reality that traditional large game studios and publishers are facing today. What you see here is a raw development budget on a logarithmic scale from the 1990s to basically now. And this is what the cost of building a product, excluding any marketing costs, um, what, what, is, what it looks like today. And what I'm interested in is obviously the trend. The trend tells us that a game have become 10x more expensive in the last 10 years than it was. So today, if you're planning to launch a new AAA IP uh, in the market, you may end up spending about $200 million just to get the game to market, and that's excluding any marketing costs. And I know this to be true because I worked on some of these games. Um, and if we extend this, if we play with the numbers, obviously I don't think this will happen, but if we play with the numbers and we extrapolate the scale, games are gonna to continue to become even more expensive. And I think we're coming to a place where that's not gonna be sustainable. Obviously, a game won't cost a billion, but you know, two or three or four or five hundred million dollars in a couple of years' time is feasible if we continue the way we are. So what's triggering this? What's the massive trigger to the increase in development cost? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, it's basically the result of size and complexity. You know, technology advancements have allowed us as game makers to make games look better, become bigger, have higher fidelity, better audio, um, <laughs> together with things like 8K, screen, 4K screens and everything that's going on, better hardware. It's, this is one of the reasons why, as a game developer, we get triggered by the idea that we can just make them better. Um, so it's, it's pretty normal. What you see here is Tomb Raider and the characters, how they've evolved uh, over, over, over the years. 
So better hardware has enabled us to make larger games at higher fidelity. Now, in short, what does that mean? Well, here's another interesting slide, I think, where we looked at another big open world action game that's in the market. The first one released in 1997, and it's the size of the actual software. You know, the first one released in 1997 was 80 megabytes. Um, the latest one, which is just shipped, was 150 gigabytes. That's a pretty astounding effect um, that even probably breaks Moore's law in terms of how, how quickly it goes up. And next year's, next year's, there will be new consoles coming out that will allow for even bigger games. And you know, cloud computing will basically give you an infinite, um, you know, massive gaming sector, a uh, gaming space, which to me is, is a telling sign. And I'm going to get to my point. Um, but the one thing that haven't changed much since I started making games is how we make them. And surely there's been new technology, all the game engines and stuff are great, they're better, they're improving every year, but in essence, tools like Photoshop and Maya and Houdini and whatever software you use to build a game, they're all software that I think, you know, essentially are 20 to 30 years, years old. Yes, they do update them on a regular basis, but to be fair, they're pretty unremarkable updates. And both, I think, it, I think to me, this is a pretty dirty secret in our industry that we haven't really thought hard about how we make games and what's gonna make them change. Um, and how we can make them, for Owen's point, a lot faster and better. So, for me, we have, we have oh, this is, by the way, sorry, this is another one. Another game that I think is interesting, this is obviously leads to this. The same tools and technology that we've had for 20, 30 years, and, but we want to build more and higher fidelity. What happens is we need a lot more people. This is data from another big games game that's, that came out in 2007. There's been several installments of this product. And this is game credits, so it's not necessarily scientific, but it's the trend I'm after again. Yes, they don't have 4,000 people building the game, but there's probably 1,000 or even 1,500 people building a game. Um, again, this becomes unsustainable to me because it's, you know, it's just the people building them, the cost of building them, it just doesn't add up. It makes no sense. So in, to sum it up, a big reason why games have become larger and more complex is down to the game studios employing thousands of people to build them. Now, if this is a problem, why, why, why is this a problem for me? Why do I believe it's a problem? I think there are plenty of big games that have been super successful and highly profitable. We spoke about some of them today, and that's all great. But I, for one, think it's a problem because as an industry, we haven't used technology to our advantage. Rather, we've used brute force. And I think the players out there deserve different types of experiences, and the technology that are coming allows for very different types of experiences along the line. In short, we've been running our development as an industry on autopilot. If I'm cynical. So what's the actual issue? What am I talking about specifically? Well, first and foremost, costs are going up. We spoke about that. Again, $200 million, $300 million to build a AAA game. But the interesting thing is a cost of a game in a store has been rem remained the same basically since I started making games. The prices haven't gone up. And yes, the amount of players have gone up, but at some point you reach, reach a point where this is not sustainable. Complexity, and we spoke about a thousand people building a game, and I think it's notoriously difficult to build a game. There's a panel about this later on, I think, and, and hopefully what they say matches what I say, but I've, have, I've done this for a while. It's very difficult to build a game, and studios that employ thousands of people end up becoming terribly bureaucratic, and the marginal increase you get in production by adding people is completely outweighed by the fact that people are not happy in these environments. They can't, you know, the, the, it becomes uh, over time crunch. You know, we've, you've read some of these articles. It's, there's the truth to this. And it hampers innovation and creativity and people don't want to work there. Risk, Owen spoke about this. If you're a game publisher today and you're gonna spend $200 million building a game, you better make sure that it's the right game you're building and that you're gonna get your money back. Um, to me, this becomes a problem because again, it inhibits innovation. 
you're not going to bet on the crazy ideas, the, the Minecrafts or even the Fortnites or the Roblox. Uh, those are less likely to be built by these larger game publishers because of risk. It's natural. It, you know, I'm not saying they're wrong. That's just the nature of how, how, what it looks like. And for me, all this hampers innovation. Top talent refuse to come work in your big bureaucratic studios, and the games you build are so massive and costly that at every turn, you're incentivized to not take creative risk, which in essence means that you stop innovating. Now, this is, all of this kind of led up to me leaving EA and founding Embark. I believe that there's a different way of doing this, and the industry is going to be different, whether I like it or not, and I better be a part of changing it than not. And at Embark, we have some deeply held convictions about the future of games in our industry. And in, we've only been going for a year, but I'm very proud of what my team and the teams at Embark have been able to accomplish in a very short period of time. And I can't compete with brutal size or force, uh, but I have to look at other ways of doing it. So I'm trying to be, more, be smarter and foster innovation and be more creative. So at its core, Embark was founded to reimagine what games can become by rethinking how they should be made. And I'm going to try and elaborate a little bit on this. So I think games as a medium is still in its infancy. I talked about this before. And the games that we will play in the future will become much more than what they are today. Specifically, I think games will need to become more accessible, more collaborative, and more interactive. Accessible in the fact that games will cater for audiences that are broader and much more diverse than most of the games produced today. More collaborative in the sense that I see a future where the online and social components of games will become an even more important factor, where players aren't just competing against each other, but are involved together to a much greater extent and a lot more interactive. This is probably our most important conviction, I think, um, that interactivity will go beyond doing that thing that game makers allow you to do, and that interactivity will encompass shaping the experience itself. Gamers will become game creators. Gamers will affect the experiences in the software. Gamers will make experiences and, 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 and stories for other players that they can then enjoy. And I think, the, you know, we've seen this happen in many other industries. If you're, you know, interested in fashion, you can easily, there, you know, the fashion industry is completely dependent on influencers and, and other ways of, of marketing their stuff. Music and radio, anyone today can record a song or, you know, record a podcast and then publish it online within seconds. Whether you are into TikTok or YouTube and have a smartphone, you can make compelling video content and share it with the world. But if you look at games, uh, that's not the case. To make meaningful and high quality interactive content, you still need the skills and resources of an experienced game developer. And in that sense, our interactive medium is elitist and closed off. In traditional AAA games, again, the, the games that we've spoke about, there are elements of creation you know, where players can create mods and things, but I have, have it less than 1% of the players that play these games actually create something that they can share with others. There are games out there such as Roblox that we spoke about that will the whole game idea is that players create things that other players can, can then experience. But still only five to 10% of the players playing Roblox or using Roblox are actually contributing to the overall network of Roblox. Our long-stated ambition at Embark and the question we're asking ourselves is how we can drastically increase user participation and make our users into creators. Our goal is that 80-90% of the people that use our games on our platform will become creators. Ultimately, we understand that we're not there yet and this is a huge undertaking and that it will require us to overhaul many things including probably the half the games industry. But I think as an ambition, um, it's, it's the right one, and the technology, and I think more the user, users out there are telling us that this is what they want. So in order to get to this, the one thing that we need to start with is to change the way we go about development and how we build games. So how, how to do this? The, the benefit I have from coming from a 
fantastic large company like EA, where you know a lot of friends and you know respect the hell out of that company. Um, but to come and start your own thing with, with a fresh mindset, you can actually have the luxury, and you probably need to just question everything that you do. You know, we were five people in a room and said, okay, what are we going to do? Um, what made it possible for us, we started talking about the change of mindset. A lot of this, how you change the way you make games and how to avoid thousands of people building a game is a mindset change first and foremost. And so we just turned everything upside down and one of the guys in the room said, what if we, what if we can get to two, two X the you know, production capacity by just using some clever tools or three X? And I said, what if we can get to 100? What would that look like? And you, you need to start questioning this from a completely upside down perspective. So the first thing we did was just a change of mindset. And then we started investing in technology. We looked at disruptive technology and realized that this will have a major impact on our industry and the way you produce products. And, in, we are, and then today we're, we're, we're deploying technologies such as proceduralism, deep learning techniques like reinforcement and imitation learning to generate content in their games automatically. I'm gonna show you what I mean. And then finally, tools. As you have the technology, you have the mindset, you, we need completely different tools to be able to do this. So we're writing our own tools to a large extent to be able to achieve what we are achieving, which I'll show you in a minute. When we started Embark, we had an opportunity to begin fresh and completely change how we build content and worlds in modern games. Here's an early look at our Iceland biome running in Unreal Engine as part of a massive world we're creating for our first game. The playable area covers roughly two by two square kilometers of the larger game world. In a traditional AAA game studio, a chunk of a game world like this would take approximately 70 weeks to construct. What you're looking at here took only three weeks for two artists to complete. We've challenged and completely changed our mindset to make this possible. All objects you see, rocks, vegetation, are procedurally distributed by a set of intelligent tools and workflows developed at Embark. This has enabled us to create content and iterate faster than ever. The world itself is entirely dynamic with full time of day, weather and seasons that change the experience each time you play. We've been able to reach a higher fidelity, higher quality and to build larger worlds in a fraction of the time with a considerably smaller team compared to the traditional studios. It's early days. Our tools and approach continue to evolve as we progress. So let's just pause for a second there and understand what we're looking at. And again, I've done this for 20 years. To build something like this would normally take 70 weeks for, you know, if you count it in man hours. Because of our technology investments, our tools investments, and a change of mindset, we can build something like this in three weeks. If you apply this on a larger scale and think about the thousands of people that worked on a game, you can understand where this is going. You can see the how we can not only build things a lot faster, but if we wanted to, we can build 10 times more using less people and also in a much easier way. The second thing I'm going to show you is another example. Embark's AI and machine learning team is developing a system that uses reinforcement learning to create animations. Here's an example of walking animations for a spider robot created by our system without any manual animation work at all. The animations are physics based, which means movement will adapt to size and mass resulting in the larger robot getting a heavier, more lumbering gait compared to the smaller one. Now, obviously it doesn't look great yet, but you can see the point. Animation is um, something that game studios spend a lot of time, money and effort doing, and it's, it's, a, it's a significant component of a game. It's also a component of a game that quite often breaks the illusion. You've seen the same animation over and over and over again, and you recognize patterns. In a world where we don't make animations where we train AI systems to, to craft animations using physics, that's not gonna happen. If I shoot this thing, it's gonna fall over and it's gonna animate it properly. If, I, if it falls over, it's gonna try and get back up again. So the system animates itself and it taught, teaches itself how to um, get better and better. When this thing, when we put this, the first time we put it on, it was basically like a newborn, it could not walk. But using machine learning, we train it an AI, we train it to learn how to walk. Again, understand that it doesn't look great yet, but the technology is there, and this will have a major impact on the games industry. And very few companies are doing this today. They're doing it in a research form. We're, we're building a product using this methodology today. 
A couple of more examples. Um, what you see here is something that I think is going to be incredibly important when we talk live services. Nexon as a company is world famous for live service operations and a world where people spend more and more time in your products um, and the, the products go for longer. You saw MapleStory from 2003 to 2019, that's 16 years. I better come up with a content strategy <laughs> that works for me to be able to serve the needs of the players for 16 years. So content creation, again, is something very difficult in the games industry. These are examples from real studios and real games that we, some of us have worked on or we've researched what they're doing. Building a character is something that you, you do in many games, whether it's a first-person shooter, a sports game, where characters are, in essence, a big portion, a bar, part of a video game. On average, it takes 16 weeks from idea to something that's player-facing for a new character to emerge in a, pro in a game. Building just a standard, this is a grenade, <laughs> in, um, takes about four days to put in a game by a regular game studio. And then building a one times one kilometer big multiplayer map, you know, takes about 24 months for, for one person. You know, we, through using the things that we spoke about, we can build a character in three weeks. Not good enough yet. I want to get it down to three days. We're working on that. But we've gone from four days to four hours to build content like this. And the most impressive one is we've gone from 24 months to month, one month to build arguably the biggest portion of this. And that's just, again, change of mindset, technology, and tools. The one thing that I'm probably mostly proud of what the team have accomplished is you can do all these things and very often quality suffers. But what we've been able to do at the same time is increase fidelity, increase size and overall quality, which is something that I didn't believe in, to be honest, in the beginning, but we're now seeing. Now, in the long term, we're convinced that the only way to solve the big content challenge that the games industry is facing requires us to educate more people to create games. By improving and innovating our own workflows, tools, and technology, our long-term ambition is to create means and tech that allows for anyone out there to create games and to become a game maker. So I'm leaving you to ponder this question. What if we enabled everyone that plays our games to become a game maker? And I hope that to come back next year and show you what that looks like. Um, with that, I think we're going to do some Q&A. Or do you want to end this? Uh, just really quickly, I want to be conscious of time um, I'm, uh, with some closing remarks. Um, you know, Patrick being Swedish is very humble. Um, so it may not, uh, what I can tell you, what we looked at, the least interesting thing of what uh, the Embark team is working on is the money that we save, which is revolutionary, as you probably got just by looking at the numbers. But that's the least interesting thing about what they're looking at. Um, they won't allow me to tell you about the AI work that they're doing, for example, beyond what we're doing, because that has to be dictated by marketing. I would love to show you that stuff. We're going to have to wait for another follow-up. So please attend next year to this conference if we get invited back. Um, but I'm going to conclude very quickly. Uh, you know, I, I promise to conclude on how you, the investor, can use this framework to make money by investing games. Number one, start by subjecting every single cliche that you are hearing by writers to harsh interrogation. The more times you read about a hot topic on Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal, the more skeptical and uh, the dimmer your, the, your view should be. Remember that the people who write this stuff usually don't play the games that they're writing about, and uh, they, uh, or they're trying to sell you something. Remind yourself how enthusiastic this crowd was about VR just three years ago, or Facebook games in 2010. Then after you've cleared your head, go to the user experience. How does all this benefit the user? What is the user really doing? What's cool for them? Um, let's again pick on VR. Do people actually want to put the device on their head for hours on end? Do they get dizzy when they do it? How many of them get dizzy when they do that? What if they get motion sickness? Do they, are they able to swig their can of Coke in the middle of a two hour uh, gameplay session? All these are things that nobody really was asking at the time. So uh, ask yourself from the perspective of the user what they think, uh, what's going, really going on. And then finally, Ask yourself what is abundant and what is scarce. You're going to make money where things are scarce, not where they're abundant. Um, there's a ton of tech, a ton of money, and a ton of uh, platforms floating out around, and there's a proliferation of all that stuff. But ask yourself what is scarce. Making a game last and grow for a really long time is super scarce, and innovating is scarce, and that's where the money is. And so that's where we're positioning Nexon. 
Um, the great news, though, is that more than any other time since the dawn of the internet, the games industry is in the middle of a Cambrian explosion of new technology. And major change in the underlying technology means severe dislocation in the industry. And that's the biggest thing that, uh, that, that you hold to be true will no longer be true. This means great opportunity for you guys. And this is exactly where we have positioned Nexon.